This week on Waterways. Longspine sea urchin, the reef grazer, and groupers of the keys. According to those veterans who have been diving in the Florida Keys for more than 20 years, the reef doesn't look like it used to. New divers hear tales of brightly colored coral heads, an abundance of grouper species, and immense diversity of marine life. New divers also hear stories of a strange species called the long-spined sea urchin, or diadema, that once littered the reef ecosystem. There aren't many long-spined urchins nowadays, um, but they used to be so common they had the nickname of the swimmer's menace. They uh, can be very common in shallow water. They have very long, slender, sharp spines that are brittle. Uh, can break off easily if you get stuck on one of those spines. It's very painful, which is how they got the reputation. At the time, they were really regarded as a nuisance species. They put a pinhole prick in you and they hurt. And that was really about it at the time. They weren't used as bait, they weren't used for food, but they really got in the way. In some reef ecosystems, diadema densities were between 3 and 10 per square meter. Divers quickly learned to control their buoyancy or suffer the consequences. Diadema used to be everywhere. They were a curse. I hated them. When they died in 1983, I was one of the happiest people <laughs> in the Keys because it made my life easier. In 1983, many divers' prayers were answered when the largest die-off of any marine animal that has ever been documented anywhere occurred in Caribbean waters. Uh, the mass die-off of diadema started near the Caribbean entrance to the Panama Canal. Uh, it started in January of 1983 when it was observed by scientists at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Uh, one of them, Dr. Harris Lesios, uh, sent out an alert to scientists throughout the region because he had never seen anything like this where between 95 and 99 percent of the urchins there suddenly die. In 13 months, the die-off that started near Panama spread all throughout the Caribbean region as far north as Bermuda. Although researchers have never been able to isolate the causative agent, evidence suggests that it was a waterborne pathogen. So possibly this pathogen, uh, they didn't know what the origin at this point was. Possibly, one theory was that it was in a, in a ship, ballast water, and the ship released the ballast water and released some sort of pathogen in the water column. Uh, studies several months after the fact, when the they tried to isolate what the pathogen might have been, uh, some researchers suggest that it's a specific type of bacteria that has caused the problem. However, that's really not been 100% determined at this point. Additional evidence that a pathogen was responsible came from the fact that only one urchin species was affected. None of the common urchins, no other marine invertebrates, only the diadema was affected. The seafloor was just littered with spines and tests. It was the most extraordinary thing that I had ever seen as a marine scientist. At least until um, a few months later when suddenly the reefs had become smothered with a very thick growth of macroalgae. Uh, this one event demonstrated uh, the significance and importance of diadema as a grazer on these reefs. But the decimation of diademas set off a chain reaction that caused many more deaths, more than 20 years later. So back in the early 1980s, 
diadema were around, the long-spined sea urchin, and uh, they did a really good job of grazing. Grazing, just as a cow grazes a field, they maintain uh, a level of herbivory, which is eating away the algae that's growing on the reef. And they did a really good job at that. Algae and coral live in a delicate balance. When there is too much algae, it outcompetes the coral for space on the reef. Without the long-spined urchins, which had functioned as sort of a marine lawnmower, the ecosystem was overrun by turf. The competition for real estate was fierce. Algae now had the edge. Hard corals were being replaced. Uh, the algae can have, without the presence of diadema, a smothering effect. It can smother the coral head, the existing corals, and impede its growth and ultimately kill the coral. But also, maybe even more importantly, the algae takes up the hard, bare substrate of maybe a previously dead coral head, and it overgrows that bare substrate. And the problem is, is corals, when they spawn, when they reproduce, they uh, release larvae, and the larvae need to settle upon a bare, hard substrate. And again, we're talking about out-competing. Uh, out the algae will grow over and not allow this new coral to settle upon the bare substrate properly. The nuisance species did such a good job of keeping the levels of algae in check, they were now missed. Tropical fish collector Ken Niedemeyer, who dives between 150 and 200 days per year, witnessed the loss of ecosystem balance. And I saw areas where I've been diving for you know, 10 years, all of a sudden changed, some of them overnight, to where all the coral had been smothered by various algaes. Uh, the coral reefs, generally speaking, had a pristine ecosystem in the sense that where there was coral, uh, there were fish and there were sponges and there were all sort of critters that generally speaking live within that ecosystem. Suddenly when the herbivores died, the main herbivore, the diadema, uh, went away, there was a big shift from a coral dominated coral reef system to an algae dominated coral reef system. By the mid-1990s it was getting more obvious that the long-spined sea urchin was not making a comeback. Thanks to a lecture by coral researcher Alina Zamont, an early advocate for diadema restoration, words would soon turn to action. She made the statement that she thought it wasn't so much water quality that was destroying the, the coral reefs as it was the lack of biodiversity. And she pointed back to the plague in 1983 where all of the diadema urchins died out. And that made sense. And at that time, I thought, what we should be doing is looking at ways in which we can restore diadema to the coral reefs. And if we can do that, then maybe we can change the ecology around uh, from algal domination back to coral domination. Martin Moe and Ken Niedemeyer sought funding through NOAA and research assistance from the National Undersea Research Center. And by the fall of 2001, they were offshore to explore the ecological results of translocating juvenile long-spined sea urchins. The sea urchins were gathered at a rubble zone, a collection of old coral that's been tumbling around for years. Every time there is a storm, the whole rubble zone shifts, and all the creatures that live in it are crushed. Because every year, by December, the most of the rubble zone has been completely rolled by tropical storms or hurricanes or just winter storms coming in. I wanted to move them somewhere where they were safe. We developed a concept for a project in which we would take four reefs. Two would be experimental, two would be control. We would replace diadema on the two experimental reefs and then we would compare the ecology of the reefs and follow the populations of diadema over a period of time, a period of one year. With over 700 diadema transplanted, 
The ecological effects of the translocated urchins on the two experimental reefs in the short space of one year were remarkable. And the total coral cover on the two experimental reefs went from 9% to roughly 16%. On the, on the uh, control reefs, where there were no urchins, it went from roughly 9% to 6%. So there was a significant difference in the response of coral uh, to the presence of the urchins. Martin Moe and Ken Niedemeyer were not the only researchers who set out to prove the importance of the reef's greatest grazer. Many were becoming alarmed as reefs choked with algae. It's been a good 20 years now since the diadema did die off, and ecological principles would suggest that these urchins would uh, restock and they would grow back in a relatively quick amount of time. It's been 20 years and we still don't see even close to uh, the densities that we saw previously. Density is an issue for diadema. Like many other marine invertebrates, diadema are broadcast spawners. Fertilization takes place externally. Diadema need to be within centimeters of each other. A, a male needs to be within centimeters of a female when they decide to spawn, which is only several times out of the year. Uh, they need to be in that close proximity so when uh, their, their gametes, the sperm and the eggs, rise into the water column, they can mix and fertilize properly. If they were separated too far, fertilization would never occur. Thanks to a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife, Brad and his team of Nature Conservancy volunteers have established a relocation program for isolated and lonely urchins. We go out and we collect uh, solitary diadema, although we'll find areas where there seem to be uh, nice small aggregates of five, six, or eight, and then maybe we'll see a straggler about 15, 20 feet aside, well that straggler off to the side won't be helping when those, when those diadema decide to spawn. So in that case, we'll collect that individual solitary diadema and pick them up, scoop them up into a net and move them to our site and form a new aggregation with all these solitary urchins. Let's see how this works. Early in the project, Brad identified a site which had discrete identifiable coral heads which seemed to be dying and covered with algae. Also, no diadema lived there. They then moved the diadema into aggregates over the coral heads that replicated the pre-die off densities. Once the aggregates are formed, we visit the site monthly and we check the changes that the diadema are, how the diadema are affecting the benthic community, the benthic community being the bottom community. So how much are the diadema really grazing? How much algae are they removing? Are they affecting the corals? Uh, and, and any changes that we can observe. And what we do is we actually take surveys. We run transect tapes or a, a long chain along the top of that dead or dying coral head. And we measure every 10 centimeters what exactly is living there at that point. We note whether it's algae and if so, what type. We also note whether it is coral, sponge, gorgonian, which is a soft uh, coral, or is it bare? And every month we collect this data off the four coral heads and also the, or the four corrals and also the four controls, and we monitor this change over time. The hypothesis is that over time, the area treated with the diadema will have less amounts of, di of uh, algae, and the areas that are treated as controls or do not have diadema at all will maintain the same levels of algae. Within 150 days, Brad and his team noted the coral heads which were initially covered with 40% algae cover dropped down to 2 or 3% algae cover. 
and what was left behind was bare, hard substrate, which is suitable for new coral growth. The Nature Conservancy study corroborated evidence from the Niedemeyer Mo study. The change that we saw in the ecosystem, namely the huge growth of macroalgae after the diadema die-off, showed that this was a species that we would call a keystone herbivore, a species that is so important in its grazing activities that it's unusual to have one species that has such a dominating effect. And its removal demonstrated uh, clearly that this was probably the most important grazer in the Caribbean. The diadema die-off affected almost three and a half million square kilometers in the Caribbean. The importance of this underwater porcupine is only recently and only partially realized. Much attention and energy has been dedicated to the issues of water quality and overfishing and these efforts need to be maintained. But could restoring diadema help to restore the health of the reefs? Could the long-spined sea urchin's grazing abilities make it the most loved species by divers and fishermen alike? It's really important to remember that all the ecosystems on Earth, be it a tropical rainforest, a mangrove community, or here the coral reefs, live and thrive in a very delicate balance. And the really important thing to remember is this: in this is that when something goes out of whack or one link of the chain is missing, the whole balance is now in imbalance, and we see drastic changes often for the worse. And in this case with diadema, they disappeared, algae reappeared, and corals are disappearing. Once the divers menace, diadema are, today, considered a keystone species the name given to a species whose survival is linked to the survival of an ecosystem. In this case, it may be that never has so much depended upon the survival of one creature, mowing the lawns of the coral reef. Family name, Serenidae. Common name, Groupers. Groupers found in the Keys include Goliath Grouper, Nassau Grouper, Red Grouper, Misty Grouper, Snowy Grouper, Marble Grouper, Graysby, Red Hine, Rock Hine, Coney, Black Grouper, Scamp, Tiger Grouper, White Grouper, Yellow Mouth Grouper, Yellow Fin Grouper, Gag, and Comb Grouper. is characterized by a large mouth and lips. There are dozens of grouper types in the Florida Keys, like the red grouper and the black grouper shown here. Groupers have a large lower jaw that juts forward. They range in size from less than one foot long for mature hinds to over seven foot long for goliath groupers. Goliath grouper is just a huge grouper and very slow moving and allows us a close approach and it is a species that has been protected for more than 10 years from enemy harvest. So it's always nice to see those um, groupers on dives. Goliath grouper juveniles inhabit the mangroves until they move on to wrecks, caves, or under coral ledges. It is typical of grouper species to live somewhere other than the reef during their lifetimes, which puts them in even greater jeopardy as habitats change.
Uh, groupers are very susceptible to overfishing. I would say by far their, their main predator is man. Groupers can be identified by a pronounced dorsal fin that is divided into two parts. They are carnivores and spend daytime in the shadows of wrecks or under reef ledges. Several species of groupers are sequential hermaphrodites, a couple of big words, but what they mean, what it means is they are able to change sex from female to male. So if they live long enough or if they reach a large enough size, then females will change sex from female to male. Overall populations benefit from large male groupers because they have exponentially more gametes and their survival traits will be passed on to the next generation. Changing sex is common, and so is changing colors. The black groupers can sometimes be all white, which can make identification difficult. Fish identification training, such as that offered by Reef Environmental Education Foundation, can help you learn to distinguish between a Graysby and a Coney, and a Coney and a Scam. But, take your time to learn the difference because your appreciation will grow with your knowledge. And knowing makes it much more fun. <laughs>